great to see you all. My name's Elaine, I come from the UK. Um, my um, my uh, experience with encephalitis is by my son. Um, he was seven years old when he became ill with encephalitis. He's 31 now, a long time ago. This is him with his, that was last summer with his big sister. He has a number of problems. Um, he has no communication. The encephalitis has knocked out his auditory comprehension, so he doesn't understand what he hears. He has so little memory for what he hears that he can't, so it, can't comprehend it. If you give him a three-syllable word, like caravan, he's lost the first syllable by the time you give him the last one. And he's also lost his speech as well now, because it's just not been reinforced. He has problems in the autistic spectrum, particularly obsessional behaviour, um, and he has epilepsy. Um, he lives in a, a community in Scotland um, called a Camp Hills com community, and there are Camp Hill communities in, in, the, in, the, in the States as well, um, which are communities where people with learning disabilities uh, live together in households uh, with co-workers. Um, and what we really like about Camp Hill is the way that they turn weaknesses into strengths. Andrew's weakness is his communication uh, and his obsessional behaviour. His strength, he has an amazing visual memory. He takes everything in by sight and he does things perfectly. So he's an expert weaver. And that's, he's, and, and all the, the other crafts as well. He does crafts. Um, but his weaving sell in the shop in the village for an amazing price. I can't afford them. <laughs> Um, he also works in the garden there, he likes to be outside and he does a lot of walking as well. So he's a very happy bunny. Um, he's not doing what I expected him to be doing at the age of 31 when he was, when he was before he was ill, um, but he's very happy there, he has a good life and that's, you know, that's the main thing. Um, last year I um, was awarded with a, an MBE from the Queen. <laughs> This uh, is Prince Charles uh, handing it to me, well, pinning it on me, that's the MBE. Oh, nice so yes, it was, it was a real honour, yes, yes. Uh, Keith and my mother and my eldest daughter were there uh, at Buckingham Palace, it was, uh, yes, it's quite, uh, quite an occasion. Okay, so um, the Brain Workshop. My brain workshops are quite interactive, so you will all need a neuron. Littered <laughs> by. Have we got enough? We're going to have to go on to share. Yeah, you can share? Okay, I've got one left my own. Okay. So this is a neuron or a nerve cell. This one. <coughs> Your nerve cell, it has a cell body, so that's the fat bit in the middle, and it has extensions, and these extensions at the top are called dendrites, and then it has a long extension at the bottom called an axon, and some frilly bits underneath there which are terminals. And s electrical impulses, which is how the neurons work, come in by the tendrils, go down the axon, and out at the end of the terminals. Now, I want you all to be neurons, and you all have to ha put your hands up as dendrites, and I want you to touch the fingers of the person next to you. So you've now formed a neural network, but I want you to make a very small gap between your fingers. So almost touching, but not quite. And that is called a synapse. Okay, put your hands down. Synapses are really important, they're like circuit breakers. If you didn't have synapses, then your nerve cells could fire continuously. And that's what a seizure is. So the synapses are there to stop your brain having seizures all the time. Really important. The red cells are the neurons, the neurons in the brain. 
The blue and the green cells are called glial cells. And one really interesting fact about glial cells is that Einstein had more glial cells than normal. And glial cells are the housekeeping cells in the brain. They're important for keeping the brain clean. They separate the neurons, they feed the neurons, they provide with oxygen, but really important is they get rid of all the waste products. And they also get rid of a lot of the heat as well, because your, your, your brain's bathed in fluid, and the fluid moves through the brain, picks up waste products, picks up heat, goes down the spinal cord where it can be tapped and tested, and then the waste products go out into the bloodstream. So that's, you have this wonderful system keeping the brain nice and clean and healthy. In your brain, you've got 10 billion nerve cells. 10 billion of these in your brain. And each nerve cell has between 10 and 10,000 10, connections with other nerve cells. They work in a sort of network. And if you, if you be conservative and say, OK, we'll assume 100 connections between every nerve cell, that is 100 billion synapses. Because each connection, there is a synapse. So in your brain, you have in excess of 100 billion synapses. Now, your brain is the most energy-consuming organ of your body at rest. OK, so Usain Bolt, his body will use his muscles and his heart will use a lot more energy uh, than his brain when he's doing the 100 metres. But at rest... 25% of the energy your body uses is in your brain. So what is all this energy doing? This huge, huge amount of energy. One of the main things it's doing is keeping all the nerve cells that are currently not needed quiet. So at the moment, the network of nerve cells that are involved in walking for you, not for me, but for you, are not working. And so they have to be kept quiet. And I'll show you how they do this. I need two volunteers. Come on, come on, two volunteers, quick, quick. <laughs> okay, so right, I'll need some more later. I'll hold you in reserve. Oh, you're coming, okay, I'll hold you in reserve. <laughs> okay, now, what I want you to do is I want you to pass that to Jude. And Jude, I want you to break it down into pieces and pass it back to Steve. Steve. Okay, Steve, I want you to put it back together again and pass it back to Jude. And I want you to break it up again and pass it back. And I want you to just keep doing that. Okay. Now, these are two neurons, and this is a synapse. And what is happening here is these transmitters that are going backwards and forwards are saying keep calm keep quiet don't do anything because this, these are part of a network that needs to be kept quiet a good analogy is if you think of a road network and traffic on it all the cars you need to keep the cars that are not needed off the road so the cars that are needed can have free access. They can, they, can, they can run efficiently. And so we have to, to keep all the cars, to keep all the, all the activity quiet. This is what's happening at all those synapses. And if you're only using a tenth of your brain at the moment, you have 90 billion synapses in your brain at this very moment where this is happening. And as you can see, they're getting tired. It takes a lot of energy. It takes a huge <laughs> amount of energy for your brain to do nothing. To do absolutely nothing. OK, you've had enough now. <laughs> <laughs> you can go and sit down. <laughs> Give them a big hand. Big hand for the volunteers. Okay. 
So that's partly where the energy is going. Just keeping everything quiet. And what happens at the other synapses where things are happening? Now I need four volunteers. One, two, three, four. Go on. Toy was interactive. That's it. That's it. How many? One more? Yeah. You coming? Right. So these are all neurons. These are all nerve cells. And, oops, I'm dropping all my transmitters. Okay. So you are? Amanda. I'm sorry, I don't have anything. Amanda. 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 Amanda is part of a network, a neural network, that is involved in seeing. Okay, so that's the network that she's involved in, in seeing. You are? K. K. K is part of a network that is, in, that is involved in, in recognising the pattern of faces. It's a really important network is this, and it's often disrupted after encephalitis. James. And James, James is part of a network that is memories. And he has memories that connect with faces. And Julianne. Julianne is a part of a network that's involved in speaking. Okay. Now you at the moment are quiet. Okay. So you are on alert. And you are on alert. And you are on alert and active. So stand up. Because you're walking in a park. Mm -hmm. You're walking in a nice, quiet park. The sun's shining. Lots of trees. Lots of flowers. But no people. Okay, so you're very active here, looking round. Yeah. And, and, so, and then you notice that someone's coming towards you. And so because someone's coming towards you, you pass all your active transmitters yeah to the person who recognises, to the network that recognises faces. Okay, wait a minute, now you have to keep standing up because you're still active. Okay, uh, but you've got but the, the, the alert one, you tend to the speech okay. network because it may be that you want to talk to this person. So you put the speech network on alert. Okay, so now you're active, stand up. You're active and you are looking at this face to see if that pattern of that face is one you recognise, is one that you've come across before. And it is, you recognise it, so you pass the active molecules onto the memories. No, the, green, the, 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 the red ones, red ones, all the red ones, and that one to the speech department, because that is even more on alert now. Oh, I stand up, right? Yeah, now you stand up, <laughs> and you will find you have the memories attached to that pattern. And it's somebody, a really old school friend, who you haven't seen for ages, and you really liked. So, so, that's, so, so, so that's, you know, really important. So now we have these three networks that are connected in, synchron in synchronicity. I want you to do a Mexican wave. So you start, okay. and then you. So, and again, so you're pulsing. I'm get tired. Yeah. <laughs> You're pulsing. You can sit down now. I'll let you sit down. So this network is pulsing and making a sort of trace. And this pulsation filters into the consciousness. So your consciousness says, somebody's coming towards me who I know, who was a school friend, and I really like a person. I haven't seen them for ages. So this trace is, is going round and round. And the other, the other part of the brain that now becomes active is your limbic system. Your limbic system is really important for the emotions because you're happy. This is a person you haven't seen for ages. And when, when this, this, this trace that is going round and round, this is how memories are made. So this trace is becoming a memory. And because you've, you've got the limbic system involved, the trace becomes really strong. You tend to remember things when you're in an emotional state. And this trace becomes active and stays active for a long time. So you go up and you meet the person and you exchange emails and how's you, you know, how's the family, this sort of thing, you know, and then you go off 
um, and you go down to sort of alert, you go quiet, and then the person goes home and talks to their husband or their wife or their friend, and then this active trace goes round and round again, it gets more and more and more embedded. And if it's a, 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 a memory or an action um, that is really important, then it gets really strongly embedded. A good analogy is, if you think of a track through a desert, the first time you walk along it, there'll be hardly any, uh, uh, any, F, any, any footprint, and then the more you walk along it, the deeper it becomes, the more um, you, you can see it more clearly, and then it becomes tarmac, and then it may become three into three highways. So for instance, the action of walking, which is learnt as a child, and then repeated and repeated and repeated, that particular network becomes really strongly embedded. And uh, there will be multiple networks. So it's like a three-lane highway. OK, we can go and sit down now. <laughs> Thank you. Big round of applause to the volunteers. <laughs> OK, so, so we've developed this trace of, 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 of a memory. Um, and, 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 and that's the way the brain works. As, as, as different networks are connected and stimulated and are used more and more, they're embedded in the brain and become part of the way the brain works. Well, where are we now? Here's a network. Here's an actual neural network. Um, which has been um, actually drawn from actual nerve cells. So you can see how they, they spread out and connect. And this is the synapse and the transmitters, so I missed that before. And here's another network. I just, I'm not going to go through all these. Right, so what happens when the brain becomes sick? What happens in the brain? There's, there's two main ways that the brain becomes sick. It be, can become infected, so that's something, an organism gets into the brain and causes an infection. Or there can be something that happens elsewhere in the body that has an impact on the brain, and that's autoimmune encephalitis, because the trigger for autoimmune encephalitis is not in the brain, it's somewhere else. But the antibodies that are produced to fight whatever it is that's triggered it, end up in the brain. So that's all you need to think about at the moment. Infectious encephalitis, so there's infection in the brain. And there are a number of organisms that can cause that infection. There's bacteria, there's viruses, there's parasites, there's fungus. We tend to call these pathogens. Is that the word you'd use? Mm -hmm. well, yeah, OK, so they're pathogens. The one that tends to cause encephalitis is a virus. And there's a reason for this. More props. OK. So if this is your neuron, then this is a bacteria. About the same size. So if you get a bacteria in the brain, and, and it was very difficult for bacteria to get in the brain, you would actually have to have a penetrating injury, really, for a bacteria to get into the brain. Then... Yeah, it can squash against the nerve cells. Um, it, can make it can grow and it can stretch some of these uh, extensions, some of these dendrites. Um, but it doesn't usually damage the nerve itself unless it's a really bad infection, which would be called an abscess. Um, and that could, cause, that could cause more damage. But bacteria are usually cleared pretty quickly. Um, they're destroyed and... and um, and cleared away. Viruses are like that. Viruses are incredibly small. And viruses, whoops, let me take the top off, can get into nerve cells. Y your, your brain's very well, connect very, very well protected. It, 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 it's covered by three layers of membranes called meninges. And if you get bacterial viruses in the meninges, you'll get meningitis. 
and it has what's called a blood brain barrier which was spoke about, spoke about yesterday the blood vessels in the brain have like a brick wall that, that it's very difficult to get anything through from the from the blood into the brain blood vessels in the rest of your body are quite leaky it's got holes in the walls so things can move in and out and gates and things like that but in the brain they're really quite it is it's like a brick wall but viruses are so small that very very occasionally they do get through and it is very occasionally which is the reason why we don't get encephalitis all the time because the brain is so highly protected that it is very 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 rare for viruses to penetrate into the brain the problem is that once they do get there there's nothing to stop them whereas in the rest of the body you've got ready immune systems to fight viruses they're not there in the brain or if they are they're, they're sort of dormant they're not active and so viruses can do quite a lot of damage before there's any control another analogy <coughs> I like my analogies <coughs> box of Lego with an instruction booklet it's very similar to our bodies our bodies are like a construction kit of Lego and the booklet is the instructions to make it. And inside every one of our cells is an instruction booklet. And it's the same with a tree or a flower. They all have their own instruction booklets. A virus is like one page of the instruction booklet. And what the virus does when it gets into a, ner into a cell, nerve cell or any sort of cell, it instructs a cell not to make anything, but just to make a, a page again just to make this page. It doesn't actually make anything constructive, it just makes copies of the page. And so the viruses, virus gets into the nerve cell and puts these instructions to make more instructions. And all the contents of the nerve cell are used up, all the food, all the oxygen, everything else in the nerve cell that's needed is all used up. And the nerve cell dies and the viruses burst out and millions of viruses then flood the brain with the, 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 the fluid in the brain moving them right around the brain so that they can infect more nerve cells. And that's why encephalitis is really so devastating. It, um, it can cause a lot of damage in a very short length of time. What happens then is you've got to deal with the infection and clear up the mess. And there's very little treatment for encephalitis. The only specific treatment is for the herpes virus. And what that does is it stops the cell transcribing the instructions. So, it no, so, so copies of the virus are no longer made. They're still there, it doesn't actually get rid of the viruses, but it stops the cells from making copies. Um, and then what you have to do, your own system, is to get rid of everything that's there. So what happens then is that you open up the blood-brain barrier, allowing your immune system, your immune cells in. Unfortunately, lots of fluid go in, goes in there as well, so you get a swollen brain. And that starts clearing things up. But you have a brain that has a huge amount of debris in by now. It has burst nerve cells, it has dead nerve cells, it has viruses, um, it has things that have moved in from the blood with the immune system that shouldn't be there, it has too much fluid. It's no wonder it takes six months to get back to normal after encephalitis because the brain, it just takes that long for everything to get sorted out and cleared up and back to normal again. Another analogy for you, it, it, to me it's like a terrorist attack on a city. So yeah, you've got your city and the viruses are like a terrorist attack and you have to clear all the debris away before you can start rebuilding. That has to be done first. And that's what takes the time. And that's why people are so tired after encephalitis. All this clearing away of debris just takes so much energy. And also the brain needs to concentrate just on doing this without doing anything else and so tiredness is, a, is, is part of the recovery system 
um, and, and, and is really common. Know what you're left with are gaps in your neural networks. So if you think again about this, this one we made, this trace, there's a gap here because you've lost some neurons. Maybe some gaps where the um, face recognition was. Um, so you can't recognise faces anymore. You don't know who this person is. You can't even work out the memories because the gap's there. You can fill the gap. You, what you can't do is make new nerve cells. The nerve cells are in, in your brain. Once they're gone, they're gone. But what does happen is that the dendrites are always moving. They're always reaching out and coming back and reaching out and coming back. And that's what, why the brain's called plastic, because it's always reaching out to make connections. And if it makes a good connection, it'll be strengthened. If it doesn't make a good connection, it'll retreat back and it'll go somewhere else. So this is always happening. So this gap that has been created because of the loss of a neuron, dendrites will try to fill it and try and reach out and make a connection and sometimes that works but it can be a very frail connection it, it, it can be quite fragile so works for a while but if people get tired then it doesn't seem to work as well sometimes the gap is just too wide um, and the connections will never re be remade but networks are constantly being made so once the debris is cleared away and as much repair can be is made as possible, then new networks can be made and you can relearn. It's not as easy as making the first ones. Um, and if you're talking about a child, then you have actually quite a diff difficult situation because a child's brain, go back to the city, has not been built yet. Some of it might have been built, but it's not all built. And some of the infrastructure is not there either. So a child's brain that's damaged not only has to repair what's been damaged, it has to try and continue to grow. And if a lot of effort's being put into repair, it's not going to have the resources to grow. And if the infrastructure is not there, then areas that are will only come online in 10 years' time won't come online properly. And that's why sometimes children will grow into problems. Um, because the damage, if they're two, four years old, it may be that some of the damage that they sustain then, that area won't be developed for another 10 years. It's not then, when everybody's forgotten about the encephalitis, that things start to happen. Yeah. Children. children. Brains don't stop developing until early 20s. Um, the last areas of the brain to develop are the frontal lobes and they're important for, it's what turns a child into an adult, they're important for planning um, for taking consequences of your actions. They connect with all of the parts of the brain um, and, and you know, m make all the vast connections. Um, they're last areas to develop. Yeah. When I told that somebody, they said, well, all those medieval kings who were kings when they were 17, 18, no wonder things went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> My parents were told by Carol I had 10% of her brain that wasn't damaged. But she's only 20 months old, so basically that's probably all that's really developed with her brain. At such an early age, when you've still got a lot of development to go, it, 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 it could be that um, there is enough resources to keep going and, 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 then, and then to improve on things. It depends, if you like, it, how the infrastructure has been affected. There are some, thing, some networks that actually develop in the womb. She has water on the brain, so... That's, yeah, that's hydrocephalus, yeah. yeah. You know, so it, it depends on how strong the networks are that are if, what I call the infrastructure. You know, if they're still there and if, if they're still strong, 
then the development can continu continue. But, to but if you've got to repair an, an area, so for instance, suppose the speech area has been damaged. Okay, so you can use some of the resources from developing the brain to, to rewiring the speech area, as long as you haven't gone too far past where the speech area develops. But that means that the pl places that are supposed to be developing don't have as many resources. So you can get a very, a very unusual pattern of problems after, after encephalitis in children. So some are develop developmental problems, which adults don't get, and some are specific problems of loss of function, which adults do get. You will get a combination of both. Um, autoimmune encephalitis, how many are people with autoimmune encephalitis? Can I ask which types? Um, Bordicated Bordicate potassium channel? Not, not sure. Hashimoto's. Hashimoto's. Right, Hashimoto's. Okay, Hashimoto's, um, from my understanding, especially from what was said yesterday, I don't think is an antibody specific problem. From what the lady was saying yesterday, the, the, e, the ENO enzymes break down the blood brain barrier, allowing cytokines to get into the, into the brain, which sets up an inflammatory response, which is something different from auto, what I understand as autoimmune encephalitis. It's, it's, it's an encephalopathy. Um, Vaulted gated, um, the remember we said that the, the, the nerve impulses go down go down the um, down, down the neuron. The way the nerve impulses are generated is because there's an electric potential across the membrane. It's I, I it's, it's really quite complicated, and this potential um, is produced by pumping positive ions outside the cell. Let me try and think of a way of explaining. Okay, okay, you're in a house and there's a hailstorm, okay, and all the windows are open. So all the hailstones are coming into the house and you're at the door shoveling them out. Okay, and as fast as they're coming in, they're shoveling them out. And you have to maintain, you, 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 this is another way where the energy is used. And you do this to keep to keep more hailstones on the outside than the inside. And that's, part, that's the way the potential works. It's, it's a very, you know, I, I mean, I've made it very simple. But uh, what happens with Volta Gated is this door gets blocked. So you can't shovel out the hailstones and they build up inside and the, no, no, the nerve won't work properly. Another analogy, <laughs> you think about the city that's bombed with autoimmune it's a railway system that doesn't work. So the antibodies are blocking the rails and the, the railway system won't work. If you can get the antibodies off the rails, everything goes back to normal because the actual buildings, the actual nerves are not damaged. So if you get an autoimmune encephalitis early enough and you can stop the antibodies, which are the problem, then you get a complete recovery. But the longer it goes on, the more long-term damage is going to be. Fortunately, um, autoimmune encephalitis now is well recognised and is treatable. Most, in, in, in most cases, it's treatable. What about NMDA? NMDA is, um, you know, we, look, we saw, looked at the synapse. There. Can you see the NMDA receptor? So these active molecules are being passed across the synapse and they're received by these receptors and they're all slightly different, they all do different things. And NMDA is one of the receptors. So what happens in NMDA encephalitis is that's blocked. And so although transmitters are being transmitted across, they're not doing anything. And it's just, the other one is AMPA, AMPA is another one. Um, so you have to deal, you have to find what's triggering the production of these antibodies to, s to stop them being produced. Sometimes it's a tumour, 
that's, that's triggered the body to produce too many antibodies. And what, if you can remove the tumour, you remove the trigger, and that's fine. Sometimes they just cannot find what is triggering it. It's probably a virus. It's probably a virus somewhere that's, that's triggered it. And, and it, over time, you will, you, your own immune system will deal with that virus and get rid of it. Um, but in the meantime, it's causing these problems. And sometimes the immune system just gets put on high alert, producing these antibodies, and it, it, it just doesn't get off high, high alert. And so the treatment is steroids, which dampen your immune system, or immunoglobulins, which is plasma that has no antibodies in, so, or has none of the, the antibodies that, um, that, that, that are causing the problem. And so if you give this plasma, you dilute the antibodies that are causing the problem. The other treatment is um, plasmapheresis, and again, you are, what you're doing, you are taking out the plasma which has got the antibodies in that is causing the problem and putting in plasma with none of these antibodies. But they tend to be short-term measures because if you're still producing the antibodies, it's still going to be a problem. You need to find out wh what's causing it. Um, and sometimes it can be very difficult to treat, even though they kn you know, it's now known what the problem is, it can still, until you can find what that, what's triggered it it, 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 it is just really difficult to treat. That is the one that, um, that the uh, doctor neurologist just bought yesterday for my daughter Sarah with her list of treatments, and she is getting IVIG treatments every yeah. two weeks. Yeah. And she is responding to that. Yeah, Anything but it's, it's, it's very short term. Yeah. It's, it's very... the end of two weeks is yeah. the because She's still producing the antibodies yeah. it's, 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 uh, until you find that trigger. I mean, it, when all else fails, you can use chemotherapy, which will actually kill the, the immune cells that are producing the antibodies. But I mean, you know, uh, you, you try everything else first. Sure. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit, really a bit drastic. Um, but, um, and, and, and with most cases, eventually the antibodies stop being produced. The last thing you want to do is give a child chemotherapy if, if you can help it. So, so this is this is the um, potassium channel. Um, and these, the, 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 this is the um, the equivalent of shoveling the. Uh, hailstones out, out of the uh, out of the cell okay so after the illness cleared away all the debris you've started rebuilding the neural networks how can you help this how can you improve on recovery um, there's, there's, there's lots of good information out there. There's lots of good information out on the internet. And one of the best books is this one here. It's produced by Synapse in Australia. This is the second edition. This is what the latest edition looks like here. But what it's really good on is what we call consequences, you call residuals, because a page is devoted to each one with information and therapies and what to do about it and it covers all of them headaches and sexual problems hormones um, and i can't speak more highly of, of this book you can you can you can send for it from from the from synapse but wendy is going to try because what we did in in the uk is we bought 100 copies from Sy from synapse and then we sold them. They, they allowed us to sell them in the UK. And I'm sure they will do the same for, for here. Um, because it's, it's called Brain Injury the Facts. Brain Injury, Brain Injury the Facts. Brain. Yeah. Um, and the organisation is called Synapse and it's in Australia. But it is a really excellent resource. Really excellent to get a handle on what the problem is and, so and what can happen. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and what else can we do? 
you can build a better brain. Your brain, is, the brain is always, it's, we call it plastic, it, it's, it's sort of always reaching out, it's rewired, it, we're rewiring, it's restructuring. But to do that, it needs a good environment. It needs a healthy diet, lots of nu nutrients, especially from fruit and vegetables, which have antioxidants in. You need some exercise. I mean, for, for people who've had encephalitis, they must be careful not to overdo things because I mean, one of the things I say, say to them is they should stop before they get tired. If they've got tired, they've done been going on too long. They have to learn to stop before they get tired. Um, so exercise is important, rest is important. And ideally their day should be exercise, whether it's mental exercise or physical exercise, followed by rest, followed by exercise, followed by rest. And, and rest, ideally, yeah, is, is lying down in a quiet, dark room. But sitting down, closing your eyes for five minutes could also clear the brain. So somebody who's, you know, working and can't, remove themselves, they can go to the loo and sit down and, and close their eyes for a few minutes. But it's really important that they do that before they've got tired, not, you know, not keep going. And w with the other group, that was one of the difficulties they found, that, you know, we're people who drive ourselves. You can't do that. It's counterproductive. They have... You've had to learn relearn the person. They've had to relearn themselves. They have to learn that what they could do before, they can't do now. Quite a lot of rehabilitation is coming to terms with who you are now and what you can do now and going forward with that instead of constantly thinking about what I used to be able to do. And that's quite hard. It's quite hard for a lot of people to do, you know, when they... Even children, um, or children know as well that they've changed. And when you have a child who used to get straight A's and now gets straight D's, they know that, you know, they know that, but they're less able to articulate, it's, they're, they're, they're less likely to get the therapies that, that they need. And that shows as behaviour problems. So where adults will get frustrated and they'll get angry and yeah, you know, they're, they're trying to get through things, children have behaviour problems. Um, and as you too well know, that's the parents' fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But we can all build a better brain, can't we? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's it. That's my end. But